Let me introduce you to tonight's speaker. Peggy Burren will be talking about how to attract birds to your yard using native plants, how to attract specific birds, and learn about the connections between birds and native plants. Peggy Burren is a master gardener and certified California naturalist. As a master gardener, she oversees the native plant garden in the Garden of the Seven Sisters in Slow. And if I'm understanding correctly, that's the garden that is uh, attached to the Cooperative Extension Building in San Luis Obispo. And she works on the Arroyo Grande Master Gardener Helpline. She is a member of both the California Native Plant Society and the Audubon Society. Her interests in gardening are to grow food plants for people and to support nature. To these ends, she focuses on growing vegetables, herbs, fruit trees, and native plants. Her home includes not only a house for people, but houses for bats, birds, owls, and mason bees. She's a regular volunteer at Cal Poly's Robert F. Hoover Herbarium. She's also a regular volunteer at the Mora Bay Winter Bird Festival. As a citizen scientist, she has banded birds, collected spiders, counted butterflies and birds, and regularly posts her finds on iNaturalist and eBird. So Peggy, it is with great pleasure that I turn the meeting over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. And um, I noticed that one of my colleagues, another Master Gardener is on the line too. So Marty Rutherford is um, one of our members. and. If there's any questions in the chat while I'm talking, maybe she can um, look at that too. So thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here because you know you're my people, like bird people, plant people. We all hang out together, so this is great. Um, all the pictures that you're going to see um, are pictures that I've taken, um, mostly in my yard or in the in the garden. So um, some of them aren't that great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a master photographer. Um, but anyways, we're going to talk about uh, how to plant with native plants and why that's important to birds. But first, I'm just going to um, try to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. Um, tell you just in a couple sentences here about master gardeners, if you're not familiar with them. Um, really, our goal is to educate homeowners, um, home gardeners, I'm sorry, home gardeners on um, plant issues, gardening questions. And so to that end, we have a helpline, um, which as Judy mentioned, I work on the Arroyo Grande helpline, but we also have one in Slow and one in Templeton. And you can call or you can stop in when, they're, when they have the opening hours and bring samples. If you, let's say you have a pest that you want us to look at and see um, what might be the problem in your garden. So just to know that's a resource for you as community members. And then the demonstration garden, which we mentioned, is located at 2156 Sierra Way. And it's a really great space. It's like a, an outdoor education center. It's open only the third Saturday of the month during these workshops we have called Advice to Grow By. So we just had one this Saturday and we're dark in November and December. So our next Advice to Grow By won't be until January. Um, but we do private tours upon request too. Uh, if we can get a docent to arrange that. And there's a variety of plots. I've listed a few. Um, as Judy mentioned, I'm the chair for the native plant um, plot. So i um, happy to share uh, what I've learned along the way about uh, native plants. So I'll start out with, this is from Cornell. Uh, we're all interested in birds um, on this call and we really wanna help them. So this is Cornell's seven simple actions to help birds. And one of them you see is to have less lawn and to plant natives. So we're right in there with um, you know, this timely talk about planting natives um, to really help the birds. And so why? Why do we want to plant native plants? I mean, we see birds and non-native plants, but native birds evolved with native plants. So that's the connection that they really, um, you'll see there's things that they provide that native plants provide that other plants don't necessarily provide. Um, these are cedar wax wings um, in my yard on a coast live oak tree. Um, they're going to come through looking for berries. So we're going to talk a little bit about cedar wax wings too, how to attract them. So a lot of people ask the first question is, what's a native plant? Like this plant's been growing in my yard. I don't know. Is it native? Is it not native? How long does it have to be here to be native? Well, there's over 5,000 native species, um, native plant species in California. And 
you know, to say that you're going to plant a native plant, there's such a variety, right? There's a diverse communities from wetlands to deserts. So you can't always take a plant, a native California plant, and just put it in your yard and hope it's going to do well because maybe it wasn't adapted to that area. But the usually the definition that people use is a native plant to California. It was here prior to European contact. So that's kind of the working definition. Um, these plants will typically provide food and shelter for native animals, which of course includes birds and insects, and they evolve to grow in our climate and in our soils. So usually they're a little bit easier to manage. Um, and I'll tell you like a closely guarded secret, you know, I, <laughs> I manage the native plot in the garden, but <clears throat> there's not a lot of work. So you'll see uh, as I go through this program, um, it sounds like I do more than I do. Um, other reasons to attract birds to your garden is uh, many of you have seen this study showing a 30% decline in songbirds. And the major reasons um, are cats, predation by cats. I love cats. I have a cat. I keep my cat inside. Um, and of course, that's recommended. Um, windows, they hit windows. Um, there's diseases, of course climate change and habitat loss. So there are many reasons why there's a decline in songbirds. And um, the World Conservation Un Union says that possibly up to 12% of all bird species are threatened. So we really want to help them. If you didn't have already a reason and a love for birds, um, I think there's some other reasons as well. But there's also benefits to planting native plants. Um, most people know and kind of assume that they're all fairly drought tolerant and they save water. And that can be true, not all native plants, because there are some that grow in wetlands, so that wouldn't necessarily be true. But usually, once they're established, the irrigation is very minimal. Uh, you can save time and money. There's almost no fertilization that's needed. Pesticides, you know, are not really needed. There's very few... Um, insects that really damage your uh, plants that much. And there's very little pruning, um, unless you need to trim it to kind of keep it in a certain space. Um, so this is why I say like, I don't really do that much. <laughs> They're very easy to take care of for the most part once you get them established. And if you're not using pesticides, then you're also reducing the chemical use. And of course the chemical runoff. And when you don't use pesticides, of course, that benefits our native insects as well. So lots of reasons to use native plants. Um, my new best friend is Doug Talame. I think some of you are familiar with his work. I've heard um, people mention his name on these um, webinars. Um, he's written several books, but these two, uh, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope, really talk about how to promote wildlife with native plants. And a couple of the things he says is that most land is privately owned in the United States. So we always think about like, oh, it should, we should preserve land and that should be something that, you know, these are public lands that should be preserved. But if most of the land is privately owned, then we as um, landowners or homeowners or have to take um, some effort to really make a difference. And even a few plants can make a difference. So his whole premise is that native plants support native insects, and he is an entomologist. So his books are really good. I'm going to quote some um, statistics out of his books uh, in this talk today. Um, definitely recommend them um, as reading if you have not already. So what do you want to attack to you? I mean, for most of us, we probably just want more. Of, a lot, of anything, right? Just bring more birds to my yard and um, different species would be great. But sometimes people are looking specifically for songbirds or hummingbirds, or maybe like in my case, I wanted those cedar wax wings in my yard. You're looking for a specific bird. Like how do you get this bird to come to your yard? Now, don't expect, like I live kind of out in the um, chaparral. Um, you know, uh, Merlin keeps telling me that I have a greater yellow legs. I have absolutely no water. So I'm pretty sure I don't have a, <laughs> a greater yellow legs, but, and I probably am not going to attract one with, um, with plants, but just to know there's some limitations, but there is some um, ability to track specific birds to your yard. Um, so when you think about that, you want to think about like, well, what do they eat and what's their habitat? Those are some of the main things, like I mentioned with the greater um, uh, yellow legs, that's probably not going to have the habitat for um, in my yard. 
So what do they need? Well, they need food, which is usually seeds, berries, or insects. Um, they need protection from predators. They need nesting sites. And to some extent, they need uh, some water. Typically, they can get water from their environment, um, but it's nice if we can provide some for them. So I'm gonna talk about some specific plants um, a little bit later in the talk, but just to give you an idea of plants with seeds. Um, these are some that I like to use, uh, buckwheat, asters, yarrows, salvias, coyote brush, willows, and ceanothus. Do produce a lot of seeds for birds. This is a lesser goldfinch on red salvia and in my yard, and they really love the seeds um, in, in the salvias. So you'll see a lot of uh, birds, a lot of birds come to this plant. Um, in terms of berries, uh, this is um, of course a Western bluebird um, with a coffee berry. I have two bluebird boxes, so I tend to get a lot of juveniles. And in when they come out of the nest, they really go for these, um, this is a coffee berry tree. Uh, that's the fourth one down. Um, they love the berries. So um, they're just all over um, at that time of the year. And it's timed perfectly with when they're coming um, out of the boxes, it seems. So manzanitas, toyons, uh, prunus, which is holly leaf cherry, uh, coffee berry, different currants, elderberry, snowberry, um, fuchsia flowering, gooseberry. These all seem very obvious, but poison oak is a really great plant for birds. It makes a lot of berries. It provides cover for them. Um, and most people don't want it in their yard. <laughs> so, but if you have a spot where you have it and it's not interfering with your gardening and you don't have to touch it, <laughs> um, then it's great if you can leave poison oak uh, for the birds. So another thing is birds love insects, right? They eat insects um, and native plants attract native insects and native plants attract more insects than non-native plants. So there's a lot of work that's been done on this and I'm gonna show you a couple, um, uh, a graph from one study that looked at um, native insects that are attracted to native plants. But it's really important because 96% of land birds feed insects to their chicks and 50% of those insects are caterpillars. So whether they're moths or butterflies, that's a real great protein source for those growing chicks. So the more that we can provide insects, uh, the better it is for the birds. Um, a lot of people don't like insects and they don't want to attract insects to their yard. So um, sometimes that's a tough sell. I think you all understand the importance of insects uh, to birds probably more than um, non-bird people. Uh, so hopefully you're okay with some insects um, in your yard. And the studies that Doug Talame did, he found that oak trees attract more cat caterpillars than any other tree. Um, or any other plant, even native plant. And he is based in Pennsylvania. So a lot of the work that he does um, covers a wide variety of species that aren't necessarily California natives. So what um, Doug, and this, I know this is really small, I'm gonna walk you through it, but um, what Doug and Kathy Kramer did was they looked at, and they're in Northern California, they looked at species of native versus non-native plants and looked at the reproductive value to butterflies and moths. So what species are laying their eggs on these plants? All the green bars are native, California native plants. All the red bars are like uh, regular cultivars that you can get in the nursery. Like it's, I know it's hard to read probably on your screen, but um, for the, the non-natives, it says acacia, cotton Easter, eucalyptus, forget me not, fennel, et cetera. Then the next page, I'm going to I'm going to blow up the, um, the names of the, the green ones and native plants. So you see that, you know, the studies kind of quote three to four times. But when you're looking at um, butterflies and moths, they're definitely attracted more to our native plants. So in blowing those up, the, the ones that were in green on that last slide, these are the plants um, that benefit our butterflies and moths in the order of the number of species that will lay eggs on these plants. So of course, oak comes up um, number one. Holly leaf cherry, which we talked about having the berries, currant, California lilac, maples, California rose, but not to be confused with a cultivated rose, lupin, Manzanitas, California sages, goldenrods, ocean spray, California honeysuckle, and penstemon. 
So um, she was, uh, Doug and Kathy Kramer were kind enough to um, let me use that material for this talk. And um, you can see that these are some of the plants that maybe would be good for your yard um, to attract butterflies and moths. So what else do they need? Uh, they need shelter and shelter um, from predators, really protection from predators. Um, they love the coast live oaks. I have many on, on my um, property. Um, so looking for having trees, bushes and nesting material too, and trying to have plants of different heights so that there is a place for them to escape. Um, I really like coyote brush. Now it's, this is the coyote brush on the left. It's all a fluff um, when it makes its, um, its seed material. That makes great uh, nesting material. Also the bush tends to be very dense and large. And I have um, California towhees and thrashers that nest underneath them. Um, and then as well as the ceanothus, the ceanothus is on the right. Uh, there's a picture of bumblebee when it was in full bloom. The bumblebees really like ceanothus too. And again, um, this is a dense shrub that's really great for shelter for birds and for nesting. So a couple of options there. And there's we're going to talk about ceanothus on another slide, but there's a lot of different varieties. And then of course, oaks. Oaks can provide so much habitat, not only for um, nesting, but also for um, protection. So water, I do like to keep a little water in my yard. I don't know that it's, you know, a deal breaker if you don't have a way to have a bird feeder because uh, a bird waterer. Um, if you hear screaming in the background, the chargers are on and my husband is <laughs> watching the game. Um, so what you um, want to be sure though is the water is clean and you can change it um, every one to two days or have some type of uh, moving water. Here's a pair of Lawrence Skull finches that decide to take a bath um, in, uh, in my yard. So now I'll talk a little bit about a specific bird. I love this website from Audubon, which many of you maybe you're familiar with it already because I think a lot of people on the call are Audubon members. But if you go to audubon.org slash native dash plants, they have a resource that allows you to look for plants that will attract a specific bird. So in this case, where the green arrow is, I put um, wax wings. It's kind of hard to see, I know, because the, the way the print, it prints on the website. And then um, in the top here, I put where I lived. So before we got to this page. Um, and then it will give you a list of plants. Now, this is just the first plant, black sage, and you can add it to your plant list. And then you can make a whole list of plants um, that that specific bird might be interested in. So it's one way for you to see um, what, what plants that specific bird might want. So what I also did then was that you can go in and you can put in your zip code. So I put in my zip code and I put in, I didn't put in my zip code, I put in Los Osos zip code, sorry. It's very similar. Um, so Los Osos zip code and then hummingbirds and nectar. So I wanted to see what um, plants would be good in Los Osos for hummingbirds um, specifically to provide nectar. And it gave me a long list, it will email you a list, but these are just the top 10 that were on the list. So you could look at that and then say, oh yeah, you know, um, I would like to, I have a lot of black sage in my yard. Um, that's a great plant for, um, for hummingbirds. So just kind of look through and say, well, I think I'd like to get that. Now, some of these aren't that easily accessible, right? Like where are you gonna buy? You have never seen maybe some of these plants in a nursery. So, um, but again, the list is much longer than this. I just put the top 10. So hummingbirds in general, though, are going to look for long tubular flowers. So flowers that have a, um, a long tube. Um, they're also going to want insects. And one thing I try to think about when I'm planning a garden uh, for birds is there's a lot of things that are in bloom in the spring and the summer. But there's very little that's in bloom in the fall and the winter. So thinking about what plants could I get that are blooming in those off seasons to attract a hummingbird, for example. So one fall blooming California native is California fuchsia. So this would be a good option um, to add to your yard. In the winter, the agaves, the yuccas, and the manzanitas are in bloom. 
Uh, my manzanita blooms in January and sometimes it's the only thing in bloom. So the birds really depend on that. Um, bladder pod is an interesting plant because it blooms almost year round. There will be some blooms on it um, all the time. It's very fast growing. It's very easy to grow. If um, it does tend to spread, it likes to propagate by seed. So um, you might wanna put it in an area where you're okay with that, um, but it might be a good easy plant um, if you're just starting out with natives. So another website that I really, really like is Calscape. And if those of you that are on the call that are California Native Plant Society members, you're probably familiar with this site. But if you go into um, advanced search over here, and I've already done a search here that I've put um, the results up. Um, this is my zip code 93420. And it came up with 71 plants. Obviously this is just the first page. And I put in, okay, extremely low water, very low water or low, right? We're all in a drought, we wanna save water. Ease of care, okay, I'm um, a lazy gardener. I want very easy or moderately easy and I wanna attract birds. So common use bird garden. And then commonly available too, because it's frustrating to say, oh, that's the perfect plant and then you can't find it anywhere. So what it came up with was the manzanitas. I have manzanitas, the hummingbird sage, um, coast live oak, California fuchsia, which I mentioned before. So you can look, um, you can click on each one of these and then it will tell you a lot more about the plant, like when it flowers, what its water needs are, how tall it gets, um, so that you can kind of decide, hey, would that be a good plant um, for my garden? So I highly recommend um, using this website as well. So I like to say that raptors are birds too, uh, because we like to attract them to our yards as well. So I leave dead trees, um, snags available for, this is a great horned owl that was in our yard, and um, try to provide habitat for a variety of different birds. Um, the uh, Northern Harriers, they like to, uh, and, and the red tails too, they like to hunt in the field. So I try to keep some area just open field and not landscaped and try to have different layers, right? You want some short, this is um, the Harriers on a very short bush. It's a California sagebrush um, out in a field um, and the raptors, some of them are gonna want taller like the red tails and the, um, the great horned owls. You know, usually when you look at the literature, it says, oh, that a perch for a raptor should be 15 to 20 feet tall. But I frequently see them on our owl boxes, my kestrel box. And those are only about 10 feet tall. So I don't know that that's a hard and fast rule. And then of course, if you have tall trees in your yard, um, that would be really helpful as well. So trying to get some layers. Um, sometimes I like to say that I live on a ground squirrel farm <laughs> because I have more ground squirrels um, than you can imagine. Uh, so I was very happy to see this red-tailed hawk on my property uh, with a meal of a ground squirrel. Um, so it's important to know not to use pesticides. And this is really for all the birds, not just the raptors, but especially the raptors. If, um, if people are putting out poison for rodents, um, that's definitely gonna get into the food chain um, for the raptors. Um, and of course the raptors like snakes. That's the only thing I get a little upset about is like, I get upset when the raptor takes my snakes because the snakes are gonna eat those rodents <laughs> and eat those ground squirrels too that are eating my plants. So, um, but it's all the cycle of life. Um, and also consider being a little messy. So insects like to grow or grow. They like to live in moist um, ground sometimes. Um, some of the uh, caterpillars, that's where they start their life cycle. So if you can consider having some bark or even bare ground or leaf litter, that's really great for insects and um, helping them um, propagate in your yard. So that's where, the, where many insects will live. In fact, the Zero Society has a campaign called Leave the Leaves and to try to encourage people to say, hey, you know, just let the leaves stay there. Um, there's another program called Soft Landings that means 
you know, leave leaves and litter underneath your trees. So when the um, when the caterpillars fall from the trees, which is uh, typically what some species do, and then they might overwinter in the leaf litter. If there's nothing there for them to overwinter on, um, then we you know we stop that life cycle. So it keeps the moisture in too. The leaf litter um, it fertilizes. We don't you know natives don't need a lot of fertilizer, but it adds um, nutrients to the soil. And if that seems too messy for you, I mean, you could put edging around, you know, to make it more appealing or add paths or benches. So um, we want to consider that there are ground feeders too, like the towies and the thrashers uh, that would really appreciate this um, in your yard. It's also good for native bees because native bees um, live in, in ground, about 70% of the species live in ground. So now I'm gonna take a, um, different tact here and talk about a few of my favorite plants and things you might want to consider um, putting in your yard. A coast live oak, as we've seen on many of the slides, this is a really great plant for birds um, for many reasons. Um, it's evergreen, it flowers from the winter to the spring, uh, but it can get really tall. So some people, you know, maybe they have a small yard and they don't want to put it in there. Um, I'm planting a lot of oaks and I'm trying to get more oaks to grow um, on my property. And I figure um, they're not gonna be 80 feet tall in my lifetime, so someone else can deal with it <laughs> in the future. So consider an oak tree if you have the room. Buckwheat, oh, buckwheat is just a fantastic plant. This is growing along the side of my driveway with no irrigation. And in fact, I mow it down every spring when I'm required to mow for, um, for fire safety and it pops back up and looks like that. It, it's gorgeous, it's evergreen. It stays pretty compact, about one to three feet. Um, and again, you can cut, you can trim it back. It has um, these lovely flowers that are from spring, summer and fall. So they start out creamy white and then they turn to rust. They make great, um, filler in flower arrangements too. So they're kind of nice to have around and really absolutely no irrigation once they're established. Um, like I've said, this is along the side of my driveway, down by the street, it doesn't get irrigated at all. And it's also a great home for butterflies. Butterflies really um, are attracted to buckwheat as well. Um, the holly leaf cherry, which I mentioned earlier, this is a picture of the holly leaf cherry in the demo garden in Slow. Um, they're right as you come in. If, if you've been there, they're really tall. Um, you can keep them trimmed down, but they will grow to 20 to 30 feet. It'll make a great screen. Um, flowering in winter to spring. So again, maybe a, a little bit earlier flowering time, which is great. Um, it's fairly deer resistant requires low water and somewhat cold tolerant. Now, when I say deer resistant, that means you know a mature plant. I will tell you that deer, and if you have deer, you probably already know this, they will eat almost anything that's young and tender, even if it says deer resistant, because for some reason, uh, they didn't get the memo that this is deer resistant. So just to know that most things, I put a small um, wire cage around, um, when they're really young to protect them from the deer. And then you can take it off once they get, uh, the plant is more mature. And I think there's something about like, they don't like the taste of it, but they don't like the taste of it when it's mature. Um, so this is the red flowering currant. This is also in the demo garden in full bloom. It's just gorgeous. It's fragrant. Um, they can, some of the currants can get six to 10 feet tall. This one's staying about, it's been there a while and it's about four feet tall. Um, it'll have dark purple berries in the fall. A uh, nice thing about this is it also tolerates part shade, but know that it is deciduous so it will lose its leaves and you know, there'll be sticks uh, there in the winter, but then it will um, pop back again. So another uh, beautiful plant for the birds, lots of berries. Uh, the California lilac, another one of my great favorites. I have several in my yard. This one is Joyce Coulter. It makes a mound of about um, three to five feet wide and about, I think it's about two and a half, three feet tall. There's so many varieties. They stay evergreen and the bloom times really vary. This picture I just took um, a couple of days ago and you can see there's still quite a few blooms, 
Um, in the midsummer, it was just covered with flowers, um, but many ceanothuses bloom at different times of the year. That's why the Kelscape um, is really great because you can go in and see, and if you wanna have something in bloom all the time, you could plan that a little bit. Um, some ceanothuses also have white flowers or very dark blue, darker than this. Um, this one that I mentioned to you that's sitting out there, it's like said like three feet tall, the deer don't touch it. I planted a little baby one next to it, they came and ate it. So <laughs> I had to go put a cage around it. I thought, oh, they don't need to see it out this. No, we'll eat anything. So um, it does uh, tolerate a variety of soils. So it might be something that would be good for your yard. And again, there's some that are super low growing and then um, some that will grow, you know, 20 feet. So you really have to look at the, each species is a little bit different. Manzanitas, again, manzanitas is great for the birds. These are the berries that are on the uh, manzanita and that's a close up of the flower. Um, the mounding bush, I wanted to give you an idea. This is Howard McMinn and this is also in the demonstration garden uh, when it was in bloom. It makes this nice rounded mound, uh, which really requires almost no pruning at all. It does that on its own. So it's a really beautiful uh, plant. Again, it'll stay evergreen. And uh, it says about three feet, but this one I think is probably more like three and a half feet, um, but close to that. Um, lots of great food. And this, again, one of the few things that's blooming in January. So a great plant to add to your garden. Now, California sages, there's a lot of salvias. Um, so they have different properties, but kind of overall, here's two of my favorites, the Hummingbird sage is up in the right uh, with the hummingbird on it. <laughs> and the hummingbirds do like hummingbird sage, although there's a lot of seeds um, when, these, um, when the flowers dry uh, that the birds will love. So it's a, it's a great plant for um, many seasons and it's short. It only grows uh, probably about 18 inches in most cases, maybe 24. Um, and it'll tolerate a lot of shade. Whereas the purple, um, Salvia that I have pictured here, Clevelandii, or many of its hybrids, there's a variety of different sizes of purple sages that you can get. Um, and they're, they're both very fragrant. Um, and they are, this one I will tell you, the deer do not touch the salvias. Um, so I think they're very aromatic and they probably don't taste great. So if you've got a deer problem, this would probably be one to try. Um, and Again, a lot of different varieties, different colors, different um, uh, heights. So you can um, check that out too. Um, now coyote brush, a lot of people don't like coyote brush for the garden because it tends to be kind of a wrangly bush. It can get kind of big, like, and I don't mean like huge, but maybe more like three to four feet. It can get leggy and woody. But the great thing about it, if you have the native um, baccarus, is you can cut it down to the ground and it pops back up beautiful and green. So you can keep it trimmed back. Um, but there are um, dwarf varieties like Pigeon Point, for example, is one that only gets like one to two feet tall. And then it kind of spreads about six uh, feet. And it seems to be in bloom a lot, like summer, fall, winter. It's still out there um, with uh, flower seeds on it. So uh, it's, a great plant tolerates a lot of a lot of different soil types, um, and the deer. I've never seen the deer eating this, so um, that's <laughs> another plus for coyote brush. Stays evergreen, and it, you can see some of the flowers on there um, with the birds. That um, the birds um, just really love this. Between this and the buckwheat, I have a lot of bush tits. The bush tits go crazy for these little small seeds, as you can imagine. Now, coffee berry, I don't know. This could possibly be my favorite plant. Um, the ones that I have growing in my yard are called San Bruno and they make a nice rounded mound. It's about two to three feet tall and about four to six feet wide. Um, it flowers in the spring, but the flowers are really, really small and almost indescribable. You can barely see them. And uh, there'll be bees all over it. Your, your, um, your plant will be buzzing. Uh, and then when you get close, you can see that there are flowers on there. But then it makes these great berries, which the birds love. 
So here's an example of the hooded Oreo on the coffee berry. Uh, but I've also had thrashers, house finches. You saw the um, earlier picture of the immature Western bluebird with a berry in his mouth. And then amazingly, I, then this bush is like, I don't know, 20 feet outside of my, of, away from my house. And I went, got up one morning and there were four deer around this plant and they were eating the berries. And I thought, oh no, they're gonna eat my, you know, my plant. And I went out there, they did not touch any of the plant. They only came over and, and picked off the berries. So, <laughs> so I can tell you that it is pretty deer resistant too, but they may come and, uh, and take the berries. It tolerates a lot of uh, variety in terms of sun and shade. You can put it in the shade, you can put it in the sun. Um, it's been a really uh, great plant for me and it stays evergreen. So it's probably one of my favorites for attracting birds. And then if you were looking for something on the smaller side, most of what I talked about are bushes or larger plants. Um, the seaside daisy or the seaside fleabane is a small mound. It's probably gets to be about the size of a basketball or a volleyball. And um, it can tolerate a lot of um, different uh, climate in terms of sun versus part shade as well. This is a picture I took just a couple of days ago. So it's still in bloom and it tends to do this. There'll be times of the year in the summer where there'll be a lot of flowers. And then it's got a few flowers, you know, pretty much into the, into the winter even. And the important thing here um, and with other plants as well is that See, I've left all this, I don't know if you can tell, there's, um, let's see if my pointer, these are all dead seed heads. And the birds will come around and grab those seeds. So it's important, you know, we like to clean up the garden and, and snip off the dead uh, flowers, but especially with this and with the salvias, um, you wanna leave the dead flowers on so that the birds can come by and get the seeds. And this plant will also um, attract birds and I'm sorry, butterflies and bees. Um, but it, it is deer resistant, it says, but uh, it's also, it's not bunny resistant. <laughs> so I, I took the cage off to take the picture for today, but uh, the bunnies will come and eat it. So um, I had to put a cage um, around this one. Hmm. So now you're all excited, yay, I hope. And you wanna go out and get some native plants or you wanna get more native plants. So where do you buy them? Um, the great news is that there's a lot of places to buy them around here. So if you're on that Audubon link, um, they have this section here where it says local resources and you put in your zip code and they tell you where to buy native plants near you. And some of you are probably familiar with the growing grounds, which is right over um, on Orchid in Slow. And Las Palitas is a native plant nursery in Santa Margarita, so that's in there. Um, Native Sons is wholesale, so it's not normally open to the public. That's in Arroyo Grande. And then they list a couple other places that I've, I have not been to, but at least it gives you options. You can go to the website, so call them and see if they have the plant you're looking for. Um, there are local native plant sales uh, that happen uh, from time to time. And as um, was mentioned, the California Native Plant Society sale is coming up November 5th. So that's awesome. Be sure, to, as she mentioned, go on to the website on October 20th and you can pre-order your plants, which is great. I'm going to do that, get some more. Um, and Slow Botanical Garden also carries um, a lot of natives. If you're on that Calscape website, they have a link uh, when you're in the plant and it'll say nurseries that carry this plant. And you can click on that and then it will list nurseries in the state of California that carry that plant. Now you may have to call and see if they really still carry it, um, but that's another good place to find. Um, that was really helpful when I was looking for milkweed and I was trying to find some milkweeds that weren't easily found. Uh, and I was able to get seeds uh, by finding a nursery that carried the what I was looking for. Now, I'm gonna tell you how you can get into the Native Sons Wholesale Nursery. There's something called CCGGA, which is Central Coast Greenhouse Growers Association. <laughs> I have to stop and think about it. And they have, a, they have once a year, and it's in April, and you can go to their website if you just Google that, they'll have an open house in April where many wholesale nurseries will open up to the public. And 
um, I think they open like 10 or 12 and Native Sons is one of them. And so I try to go there because there's a really great deals on plants. They'll sell, you know, like all one gallons will be one price or all, you know, four inch pots will be one price and they have a lot of natives. So it's another good way. The only bad thing is, I'm just gonna tell you on the next slide, April's not really the time to plant native plants. So it's a little bit of a, I wish they had the sale um, and I wish they were open in the fall because that's really the best time um, to plant natives. But if you're, um, it's a really fun thing. And they also have other nurseries that are open that are selling vegetables and flowers and, and a variety of different things, um, but not all native. So birds, I'm sad about the window thing too. I mean, they, they hit the windows for a variety of reasons, you know, day and night. Um, I think it's just important when we're talking about gardening is that um, we try to put the plants either and the feeders either close, like three feet from the window or far, like 30 feet. So this photo is uh, my friend's house in Illinois and she's hung nylon cording every four inches to um, prevent the birds from hitting her window. And you can see, look at all the greenery in the background. Boy, if you were a bird, you'd come flying in there and say, that looks like a nice tree. So, you know, they, we wanna kind of break up the reflection and hanging some kind of cording or ribbon, um, putting decals up, you know, they now have paints and markers, you could even you know, draw on your windows, um, using exterior screens, there's a lot of different things that maybe you can do if you have um, an area where birds might hit your window. And I understand now that they're coming out with, they have bird-friendly glass that has printed patterns on it, so hopefully um, there'll be an uptake in that as well. So what if you say you're listening and you don't have a garden? You can still uh, provide some habitat with native plants. Um, maybe you have a bird bath. Um, here's some of my friendly um, acorn woodpeckers that like to hang out in my bird bath. Um, but even if you have just a porch or a balcony or a rooftop, or window box, a vine, you know, some greenery, some native plant that can um, help our local birds, um, you can still do something. Um, so now I just wanna switch gears and talk a little bit about caring for native plants. I know I'm talking a lot and um, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, and so hopefully you'll still, you're hanging in there with me. Um, so one of the first rules is to plant in the fall, like right after I just told you that there's a sale in April. Um, it's really, really important with things like Ceanothus, Oaks, Toyons, and Manzanitas. In fact, there's sort of an unwritten, well, sort of written rule not to plant any natives after February 28th. Now, I don't know what you do on leap year. I think you go to the 29th. But if you want to plant them when they're in their growing spurt, right? And, and most of our natives, their growth spurts are in um, the fall and the winter is when they're growing. You know, in contrast to some of the other cultivars that you're going to buy, you know, if you're going to buy uh, a fruit tree, you know, you're going to plant it early in the season and that its growth season is going to be in the spring and summer. So um, natives are going somewhat dormant in this summer. So you really don't wanna plant them um, at that time. Uh, and especially with these uh, plants that are listed here, they're really likely to die um, if they're planted at the wrong time of the year, even with adequate irrigation and, you know, so just a caveat to try to plant. And now is a time we say is, the best time to plant is after the first rain. So we've already had our first rain um, and it's been a little bit cooler. The days are getting shorter, so it's cooler um, for most of the day, less, less uh, solar radiation. And it's a good time um, to plant. And that's why, of course, the plant sales for native plants are usually at this time of year. So, oh, there's another, um, there's another bird that likes my coffee berry. <laughs> um, so care of native plants um, continued. Um, watering is probably the hardest thing that people have trouble with because they want to water it like um, any other plant. And you really have to look at the specific watering needs. As we mentioned, some um, plants came from riparian areas where maybe they need a lot of water and other plants came from a desert. So that's where that Calscape um, website comes in really handy because you can look up the specific watering needs. Um, it's also important, especially if you're new to it and new to this plant, 
is to check the moisture level. So what I usually do is I plant it. Um, and by the way, we're, um, we're gonna give you a link to get a handout on caring for native plants that talks a lot about this. So you don't have to um, memorize it, but you know, uh, water the plant every like three to four days, maybe twice a week when you first get it for a couple weeks and then move to once a week. But checking the moisture, because you want to wait until like if your soil if, isn't draining well, you don't want to put more water onto a moist soil. So you like to let the root ball dry out, then add the water. So constantly checking, at least when you're first new to planting natives. Um, and then that's in the winter and the spring, we're going to give them um, adequate water. Uh, that would be what they were used to. But then in the summer and fall, we'll infrequently water them. Um, and in some cases, like I said, with the, um, with the buckwheat, not at all. Um, most people recommend that you should mimic rain and use overhead sprinklers for natives. Um, I, you know, my house was already set up for drip and I have a lot of them on drip and it's not a problem. Um, but if you find that maybe you have a plant that's getting too much moisture, maybe drip's not right for that plant and you wanna go to overhead sprinklers, or you can put little mini sprinklers. You can um, swap out your drip on your drip tubing, um, the drip, and put in a little micro sprayer that then kind of um, sprays water out on the plant, and that might be better for um, some plants. So just options. So what we like to say about native plants is that the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So people sometimes get a little impatient when they put this plant in and like it didn't grow. You know, maybe it's dead, maybe I'm gonna pull it out because I thought it was gonna to get to be a three foot bush and it's still six inches tall. So give it some time. Um, in fact, with the, remember, um, like it was a year, year ago or two years ago, we had like really hot weather, like a hundred degrees, like almost everywhere, right at the beach. And I lost some manzanitas, they died back and I thought, oh, they're dead, maybe I should pull them out. But I just am a lazy gardener, as I told you before. I love them. I said, well, maybe they're going to be okay. And you know what? Two years later, they started sprouting again. So you just never know. Sometimes I just give them a second chance. Um, this is an interesting picture that I have. I don't know if you can tell because it's kind of small, but there are three flickers and two American robins. Um, in this uh, in this tree, I had a pair of nesting flickers um, in my yard one year. So I've been called a lot of things, but um, crazy plant lady is definitely on the list. A friend of mine bought me this towel <laughs> to remind uh, everyone. Um, so think about like how you can incorporate this into your um, into your yard. So what I like to think of as a plan is that whenever an alien dies or a non-native plant, I'll replace it with a native. Um, and another thing you might want to consider is either reducing or eliminating your lawn and just starting small. You know, if you rip out your whole yard and put in all natives and then you have, you know, you don't have success, then you get frustrated, right? So it's, you start small, plant one, um, plant some of the things that say they're easy. Um, and if you don't have an issue in your area with fire, you know, it's really good to plant dense plantings of varying heights because that really provides a lot of great um, shelter and nesting areas, um, as we talked about before. But I know with firescaping, we try to plant um, the plants more um, spaced out, which is how I have it in my yard and, and the birds still seem to love it. So this was recently in the LA Times in September and I just thought this was a great quote because it said, um, this is an ecologist who said, humans are dependent on biodiversity. And if we reduce biodiversity, we're reducing our opportunities to survive on the planet. So today we're talking about trying to increase biodiversity in our yards to attract birds. But really, if we do that, we're probably helping our population as well. So if you're really excited and you say, I'm gonna plant plants for birds, uh, you can buy a sign from the Audubon Society that says plants for birds. And it says the native plants in my garden provide food and shelter for our beautiful birds and they contribute to a healthier world for all of us. So I ordered mine and put that in my yard. And here are some of the resources uh, we talked about. I think I'm right on the money at eight o'clock. And so thank you. And thank you from some of the birds that have also visited my yard. <laughs>